Hi there, thanks for having me. My name is Michael Livingston and I'm presenting on behalf of the authorship group from the new edition of Alcohol No Ordinary Commodity. And first, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that the land that I'm presenting from is the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation and have never ceded sovereignty. Uh, my presentation today is going to try and summarise a ginormous literature on the physical availability of alcohol, uh, various interventions used in that space and their effectiveness. Um, I'll just get cracking because there's a lot of material to get through. So the availability restrictions are a kind of classic uh, alcohol policy lever. They're one of the World Health Organization's best buyers for alcohol policy alongside price and advertising, which you've also heard about today. And that the basic theory, such as it is, is that if you increase the availability of alcohol, you tend to increase alcohol consumption, which increases alcohol-related harms. It's a very simple version of, of the way the world works, but it's a pretty useful rule of thumb. Um, there are obviously uh, variations in how this plays out from a different types of availability, different types of society, different types of outcomes, but as a broad brush rule, that's how the evidence, to summarise this talk ahead of time, that's what the evidence tends to show. Um, when we're talking about avail availability restrictions, we're talking about a whole range of policy options that try and regulate when, where, and how alcohol can be bought and sold. And these are usually regulated through liquor licensing systems or through government monopolies or through some sort of arrangement that manages the way that alcohol is, um, is, is sold in a society. Uh, of course, the, the most strict form of availability uh, intervention is, is complete prohibition. This is a, a, a policy that's been in practice historically in many places, is still in practice in some countries and states at the moment. There are, there are um, predominantly Islamic uh, countries and some other jurisdictions where alcohol sales are prohibited. Uh, it's most famously, of course, uh, a US intervention in the 1920s. There's a lot of um, folk knowledge about US prohibition. Uh, it's actually, the evidence looking back is, is surprisingly clear that it had a, a strong impact in terms of reducing consumption and reducing a range of harms, but that, that impact declined as the kind of problems around pro pro prohibition started to play out. As the illicit market grew, as organized crime got involved, as enforcement got laxer and laxer, we saw here just a, a, a figure of deaths from alcoholism um, showing the kind of steep decline that dissipates over time as the, effect is, the, the effectiveness of pro prohibition is reduced. So it tends to be something that has a, a potentially beneficial effect on health, but is very complicated to manage from a societal point of view. The most recent example really from a health perspective is, is South Africa during COVID, which many of you will know more than I about. But it seems pretty clear that during the brief periods uh, at the peak of the, the pandemic when South Africa basically prohibited the retail sale of alcohol, uh, there were some pretty big reductions in mortality around kind of um, uh, non-external cause mortality, mortality that we think could be linked to alcohol in some way. So that, uh, this, this, the, the brief uh, bit of work that's been done so far suggests around 20 lives per day were saved in South Africa via the um, temporary imposition of prohibition. So this is still a policy that has potential in some situations, but there does there's a, a fair bit of evidence that in societies where it's not a popular policy that, that the ensuing complications around things like organised crime and illicit markets probably outweigh the benefits. The kind of next step down the chain of um, how you manage alcohol in a society is, is by a government monopoly. So this, rather than having a private market, you have the government controlling the, the sale and um, operation of the alcohol market. And this is pretty common. This is, we think of this in, in Australia, at least, and probably in some other places as kind of a historical exercise, but it's, a, um, it's still in play in something like 50 countries around the world in some form, whether it's a, a monopoly on the retail market or the wholesale or the production market. But I think, it's still something that is, is worthy of discussion as a, as a good um, potential intervention. And it, it's, um, it's clear that trying to strip back the kind of private profit motive from a market can result in a more public health oriented system of, avail of availability. So the classic example of this is the Swedish model system, Belaget, which is a, the alcohol retail monopoly. It reports to the health ministry. One of its clear mandates is to try and maintain public health and reduce harm from alcohol. And with that in mind, they tend to have fairly strict um, conditions. There aren't that many stores selling um, alcohol. There aren't wide trading hours for, for retail sales. So Sundays are often closed. I think the stores shut pretty early in the evenings. And there are restrictions around things like discounting and two for one deals and so forth. And advertising 
is not a focus of the monopoly because they're not trying to boost their profits. Um, there's been a bunch of work around the effect this has on uh, the society and, and the best estimates from some recent modeling that Tim Stockwell and others have conducted is that if you stripped, if you completely removed the Swedish monopoly system and let the private market have their way, you'd see something like a 50% increase in alcohol related death in Sweden. And this comes from a range of work, but including some historical work in the Nordic countries, which has shown when they privatise sales of particular beverages, usually strong beer, um, there were huge shifts in how people drank and the harms experienced. But monopolies aren't always a public health tool. There's certainly in some US jurisdictions, monopolies have been run focused more on profit than on health. And there are some efficiencies to a government run market that privatisation can strip away. So in some, there's some evidence from the US that when markets were privatised, prices went up and there was no real shift in availability or harm. So it, it depends on how the, the monopolies are run, but there's certainly good evidence that in some circumstances, the monopoly can really be a good public health intervention. Once you move to a licensing system, you kind of then, uh, you're, it's how you manage the private market. And so the, one of the key uh, levers you have as a, as a licensing agency is uh, specifying how many or where alcohol outlets can be located of different types. So, you know, can, can you open a bar in this kind of neighbourhood where there's already 100 bars or are there some restrictions on how that um, is, is managed is a kind of key decision for a licensing system. And we know from kind of historical studies where there have been big changes. So when you have a dramatic uh, shift in how alcohol is regulated. So for example, if you allow supermarkets to, to sell alcohol, you often see a huge increase in the number of retail outlets. Uh, that's pretty clearly shown to in influence consumption in both directions, whether you introduce new outlets or, or remove alcohol from these kind of outlets in, in a, a fast natural experiment kind of way, you see uh, the expected effects on consumption and harm. There's a bu bunch of examples from the Nordic countries and elsewhere, um, often a bit confounded by other changes that go on at the same time, but the evidence is pretty clear that in these natural experiments of, of large scale shifts in availability, consumption uh, either increases with increased availability or decreases. The more gradual changes that we often see in kind of mature markets are much harder to assess. So we've done a, there's a, there's a whole field of literature looking at these suburb or city level models of change. So as, as you know, the, the market seeks to open more and more venues in a certain neighbourhood, what happens to consumption and harm in that neighbourhood? And there's a huge variation in this literature, depending on the outlet type, whether we're talking about bars and pubs or we're talking about uh, supermarkets or retail outlets and the outcomes we're worrying about. If we're thinking about uh, bars and pubs, we usually think about violence late at night. If we're thinking about retail outlets, there's a whole range of other things to concern ourselves with, including domestic violence and, and heavy consumption. The, the, the markedly varying findings in the, in the literature have kind of raised questions about how useful this, um, this field of research is for policy. Um, I think in general, we found in this review that the, the high quality studies that look over time, that use good design, tend to have fairly consistent um, findings. And, and the, the findings generally point to the fact that neighbourhoods that increase their availability uh, tend to increase their, their harms, especially the availability from retail outlets and especially from kind of drinking oriented venues. So not restaurants and cafes so much, but bars and pubs seem to be a, a problem. This whole area becomes more and more complex as we see a growing market for home delivery. And that's really an area where there's not a lot of research um, and it's clearly one that's changing dramatically, especially given the pandemic. Uh, the evidence around trading hours or trading days that are permitted is another strong, well-studied um, field. There are a series of systematic reviews that show pretty consistently that if you increase the, num the, the time or the days that alcohol is available, you tend to increase consumption and problems. Uh, there's a, a sort of small but fairly clear um, field of work around days of sale. So when Sunday trading is permitted or restricted, consumption tends to move in the direction you'd expect. The evidence on harms is, is not as clear. Some studies find no real shift. Some studies find some increases in things like road crashes on Sundays when Sunday retail trading is allowed. The clearer evidence um, is around nighttime trading. So there's a, there's a small number of studies that look at retail outlets, so takeaway, off-premise, whatever language you want to use to describe them, and what happens when you restrict their trading at nighttime. So there's studies from Switzerland especially, but also from Russia and Lithuania and Germany. Here's just an, an example that shows uh, when the, the dark line going down is a, a shift in the hours that off-premise um, outlets were allowed to trade in Switzerland. And you can see pretty um, significant reductions in harms for young people. The line going 
that continues unchanged as a control site. So making the, the bottle shops or the retail outlets close earlier in the evening pushed harms down among young people in this study in Geneva. And it's consistent across a few other studies as well. This is especially uh, tends to reduce harms for young people. The biggest literature looks at um, late trading for on-premise menus, for pubs and bars and nightclubs. And we're talking about often restrictions about whether you can open until 3 a.m. or till 1 a.m., sort of the, the wee hours of the morning. And this evidence is pretty clear. I mean, there's a, a really nice study, even from, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of studies from the classic Australia, US, Canada, kind of um, Nordic countries. But even this great study from Brazil shows that when they implemented an 11 p.m. closing uh, time rather than 24 hour trading, they saw a market reduction in homicide. So, really, um, powerful impacts on harms in, in that study. But also, this is a study that Kip Kipri and I did in Sydney, which showed uh, when they shut the pubs in Kings Cross and Sydney at 3 a.m., assaults went down quite dramatically. This is the kind of counterfactual. And then there was some shifting of those harms to areas where these restrictions were not in place, but overall a, a big reduction in late night assaults from closing the pubs rather at, than at 5 a.m. at 3 a.m. So this is a kind of intervention which can be pretty controversial, controversial but uh, doesn't affect a hell of a lot of people drinking it at four in the morning and tends to reduce kind of some of the really pointy end harms. Uh, there are studies showing effects in both directions. So restrictions tend to reduce harm, loosening of those late time, late trading hours tend to increase harm. Usually violence is the outcome in this field. And a key thing to think about when you're, when you're looking in this research is that the effect of the restrictions is almost entirely contingent on the, the degree to which they're implemented. So there's some good examples from New Zealand where they introduced a law restricting uh, late night trading, but fewer than 10% of the outlets were trading beyond that point anyway. So it had a very small impact on late night availability and thus a very small impact on harms. Um, there's similar arguments around the UK where there was a, a loosening of laws in the early 2000s, whereby many venues didn't take those, uh, the, the, the the possibilities were open late, they decided not, not to follow through on that. So we saw little real impact on harms. So we've done where and when, this is who, this is the restrictions on who can buy alcohol and the classic uh, uh, restriction is around age. There's a, a minimum legal purchase age or a minimum legal drinking age implemented in almost every country in the world. Um, the distinction is, is fairly minor, but it sort of focuses on where enforcement um, spends their attention, whether it's about the kid drinking who gets in trouble or the person selling the alcohol who gets in trouble is kind of the key concern with the language there. Um, there's a lot of variation internationally, 18 or 21 are kind of common ages, but there's, there's variation from teenagers to mid twenties. Most of the evidence comes from the US where there was a, a states over a period of a decade or more, gradually all shifted their minimum purchase age to 21. And that evidence from the US is strikingly consistent that um, harms in that age group fell quite sharply, especially road traffic related harms, but a range of other harms as well. And this has been summarized in systematic reviews, um, showing clear effects on, on traffic harms, on consumption and heavy drinking, and even on some kind of longer term impact. So people who grew up with these laws in place have less later harms around things like suicide or alcohol use disorder than those who grew up with more loose laws around drinking age. There's a pretty good set of studies by Chris Carpenter and Dobkin looking to summarize the full effect of these changes in the US and suggesting, for example, that traffic fatalities for 18 to 20 year, 18 to 20 year olds fell by almost 20%, suicides by 10%, heavy drinking by about 3%. So some pretty um, striking effects uh, for, for this change in the US. Here's just a graph showing uh, rates of harm um, mortality rates for various causes up to the age of 21 and after the legal after you become a legal drinker and you can see for motor vehicle especially a clear discontinuity so the rate of harm really jumps when you turn 21 and you're allowed to drink legally which is a pretty clear indication that this policy is making a difference to people's drinking behavior alongside all the us evidence there's some pretty um pretty good supporting evidence from places like australia where the drinking ages were lowered and new zealand similarly and some recent evidence from Denmark, all, all pointing in the same direction that, that drinking age can really affect the consumption and harm of the group affected by the law. And some evidence that it even kind of can affect people younger than that. So if you if you lower the age to 18 and some, some New Zealand evidence, I think that shows 
not only do 18 and 19 year olds have more harms, but the 16 and 17 year olds harms can increase as well by a kind of social supply and so forth. Obviously just having the law isn't the full story. Enforcement is clearly crucial. There's some nice studies that show the better you enforce these minimum age laws, the more effective they are at reducing harm. And the effects on particular outcomes can vary depending on context. There's a good study from Australia that su suggests the drinking age has little impact on traffic harms because our, our drink driving laws and our restrictions around um, alcohol and youth driving are so strict already that they make no difference, but other harms uh, are effective. There's a range of, those are the kind of key interventions we've summarised. There are a range of other interventions worth thinking about briefly. There's a kind of growing return to this idea that we can ban purchases by problematic people. This, this tends to kind of play into an industry focus on bad apples or bad drinkers or, you know, just trying to deal with people who can't behave properly while they're drinking. But there is some good evidence that really well-targeted and enforced bans uh, can reduce harm. There's a study out of, a series of studies out of South Dakota that showed when they implemented a, a ban on repeat drink drivers, a ban on drinking, a ban on ever having um, BAC you know, above 0.02 or something in their system, involving ankle monitors or daily checkups. Uh, they not only reduced drink driving in that cohort, they found kind of population level effects on things like mortality and family violence. So there's, if you can target your intervention well and implement it, it's very invasive as an intervention, but it has shown population effects there. Although there's, as, as they've tried to grow that intervention, the replication findings are less convincing. There are historical versions of this. Um, there's a, there's a permit system in a few of the Nordic countries and the evidence there is not strong and, and partly due to lack of data and um, but suggests some evidence of effect that having a taking someone's drinking permit away from them could reduce the harm they, they experience. And just recently in, Aust in Australian jurisdiction, there's been a banned drinkers registry introduced and the evidence is still kind of developing on the impact it will have in that space. Uh, some other interventions include changing the availability of alcohol based on the strength. Um, so for example, in many of the Nordic countries, I, I know in Sweden in particular, low alcohol beer is widely available while beer above 3.5% is not available in the grocery stores. That's got some evidence of effectiveness. It certainly seems to be pushing uh, people to choose to drink the less um, potent beer option, especially young people. Uh, there's been a sort of growing attempt to restrict some sort of high risk beverages. So, you know, removing high alcohol cider or cheap boxed wine from various communities or stores. And the evidence around that remains pretty mixed and probably reflects price impact. So often they're the cheapest way to get drunk out of these beverages that have been the target. So rather than strength, it's probably more of a price um, intervention. There was a big push in the UK around this, around trying to reduce the number of um, standard drinks sold via a collaboration between government and industry, which has been controversial and, and probably hasn't really had the effect that it was proposed to have. There are restrictions in particular settings, for example, the most famous one is sports stadiums where you restrict the either sale of any alcohol or sale of strong alcohol within sports stadiums. These are not well evaluated, um, but some evidence has been found that they, they reduce harm in and around the stadium or the event. So summing up, uh, it's pretty clear that availability restrictions are effective. They're a key component of, of our approach to alcohol restriction alongside price and advertising restrictions, especially those uh, interventions around trading hours, largely um, late at night, uh, minimum purchase age and on the physical availability of alcohol through the density of outlets. How an intervention will play out depends a lot on the context, on the politics, on the community support, but we've seen some good examples and I'll quickly talk through one where multifaceted interventions involving availability restrictions alongside price and other uh, interventions can really be effective. So this is a recent example from Lithuania, which is kind of engaged in a, a 15 year um, process of, of improving their alcohol regulation, of increasing prices, of reducing the types of places that can sell alcohol, of cutting back on advertising, on increasing the drinking age, uh, reducing the trading hours for retail outlets. Um, and combined, these, these policies have had huge impacts. Consumption has fallen, and we've seen increases in um, life expectancy and reductions in a range of mortality. So there's a good example of a kind of putting all the pieces together in Lithuania over the recent years. All right, that's me summing up. There's a whole bunch of references here for the key claims I made. I just want to acknowledge the full authorship group of uh, Alcohol No Ordinary Commodity whose work this reflects and my personal funding. Thank you.